Good day, everyone. Um, my name's Ryan Thomas. I'm a development team lead at Atlassian, and I'm from our Sydney office in Australia. So myself and Greg Warden, who's going to be running the hackathon with me tomorrow, um, sort of flew out here the other day. Now, um, we're nowhere near as advanced as the last sort of couple of guys we saw. It's um, awesome to see that in production. We're still in the development phase of building out um, an internal pass inside of our company using um, Mesos. So I just want to go through sort of a bit of the design we have there and the sort of iterations and the, the different things we, we sort of tried throughout there. So I want to cover why we're actually building this. Um, some of the design considerations we have, we have some um, sort of network requirements that um, needed to be met, as well as both service and platform design, and then the current status of where we're at and some of the challenges and some, um, I guess, ideas or talking points. I'd love to bounce off some guys um, over a few beers tonight. So who here has actually used um, Atlassian products? Jira, Confluence, Bamboo, those sorts of things. Awesome, awesome. Now, um, if you've ever started them up or administered them yourselves or done anything like that, you'll understand that they are traditional, monolithic, single tenanted Java applications. So these are things that, you know, they take minutes to start up type thing. It's not, you know, 300 milliseconds to start serving requests. So they're big. Um, the part of the company I work in is called On Demand. It's our SaaS offering for these products. So part of our um, sort of drive to increase the density we have in our data centers of the customers, as well as improve the customer's experience, is to identify the um, components within those products that we can extract as tenantless shared services and push out into some internal pass and actually run them there to both give us better density and improve the performance and be able to scale out the components we need. So um, part of that is also we want to sort of facilitate quick development cycles of these services. We don't want the service to be released, complete, and sitting there for two weeks before it actually goes in front of customers. But by the same token, we also want to hook into our current sort of CI pipeline, all the common terminology we have internally around how we actually release software. So some of the considerations we had to take into account for um, building this were, it had to run in AWS. And not only in AWS, inside of a VPC with no public routes. We needed a single point of entry um, through our edge, which we use um, a cluster of riverbed stingrays as our common edge, so we needed that single point of entry, as well as a single point of egress, which is through a cluster of um, squid proxies. Obviously, we need that egress because we don't have any public routes in there. This needed to be accessible from our data centers over the Amazon Direct Connect link straight into our VPCs. And the standard operating environment for our services needed to be decoupled from the service itself. Now, this was important from our operational perspective because we didn't want to have you know, 10 different minor versions of the JVM running in production. We wanted to reduce that surface area down to something the operational team controlled rather than the service developers. So, um, in order to do that, we containerize our services and our service op uh, standard operating environment as well. We use Docker for this. Um, we use Docker for quite a bit of stuff in there, and it's um, fantastic. So this allows us to deploy the service as a slug. We sort of borrowed the terminology from Heroku, Flynn, you know, wherever you want. We deploy it as a slug and inside of this Docker image. So that allows us to be able to upgrade the Docker image, test it all in our sort of testing cluster, and then roll it out again without changing the service itself. So this means that if there is a JVM bump or some version bump that we need, we don't need to re-roll all of the services that we have um, running in production. We can simply just roll out the new um, SOE. Now, a the slug is simply a TARZIP with a known entry point. So it it's not sort of um, affiliated with any one language. It's simply a TARZIP of the application that we run with that known entry point in order to invoke it. Now, the next two points, they're, they're pretty straightforward, but you know, we needed these services to be stateless. Like, I, th I think this is pretty common um, in, in sort of this area. And we provided no guarantee consecutive requests were going to route to the same node, obviously. So we didn't do any sort of session affinity or anything like that. Now, the way we define these services, and this was sort of our interface um, for the development teams that were using this, was through a declarative mechanism we called the service descriptor. It's, um, you know, think of like your proc file for Heroku or something like that. But it lists out, you know, things we needed, like the owner, the health check URL, the page of duty escalation queue, the actual artifact, where to fetch it from, the, those sorts of things, the language, the number of nodes you wanted, all, all, all that sort of good stuff. And the way that works is we have this um, service manager. Oh, can't see. 
we, we have this service manager, which is our um, interaction point with the customer that is the developers inside of Atlassian. So that's how they interact with the rest of the system, poking the service manager. And what it actually does is it'll interrogate the um, service descriptor, pull out the relevant section in order to build the slug, go to our slug building service and package that up. Again, tarzip it up. We're traditionally a Java shop, so most of our services are Java. So for a Java example, we go to our internal Nexus repository. It's got the Maven coordinates inside of the descriptor. Pull it down, package it up, create the entry point inside of the tarzip, and um, push it up to our repository, which is um, essentially just an S3 bucket. The service manager is also responsible for a few other items. It'll create the empty pools in our edge cluster, so in the Stingray, so the service will have um, pools created there for either the external um, domain name or the internal domain name. And then it'll actually poke our container manager, which is, um, which is sort of where Mesos and everything fits into this, to actually provision the service. Once the service actually starts, we pull that standard operating environment from our Docker registry, and that is then started with the slug as a parameter, and it'll actually pull that down. Now you can think if we have a completely brand new slave with, um, with nothing in it, nothing in the local Docker registry, the time to actually get into the application code is the time to pull the Docker image from the registry, the time, plus the time to pull the slug down, plus the time to explode that inside the container. That's when it gets into the application code. So um, there can be a bit of a delay on a completely fresh um, slave. Of course, we can optimize this a bit by sort of preloading the Docker register, the local Docker registry in our AMIs. But um, again, that's just an optimization. We have this um, service locator service, and once the service starts, it registers with that. And then again, a load balancer manager sort of reads the state from that and updates the pools in our edge so that whenever those um, services um, change or the heartbeats fail or anything like that, the load balancer manager picks it up from the service locator, pushes them into the edge. The edge also does um, health checking of the services as well so that we're not actually routing traffic to dead nodes. So that's what it looks like in total. Um, there's sort of two points of ingress into the edge. There's the .io um, domain that we have for external requests, and there's also a .internal TLD that we have that we route from our data centers over the Amazon Direct Connect link. So our first iteration of this, this was towards the, the start of the year, was essentially Mesos Marathon and the Mesos Docker Executor um, for our container management. Okay, we used the um, Eureka from Netflix to do our service location, and then our service manager, slug builder, um, load balancer manager were all written in-house, very small um, closure services that we run there. Um, this was all right. We tried to put everything we could into Docker containers, that is um, Mesos Master, Mesos Slave, Zookeeper, Eureka, everything in Docker containers running, which was fantastic for our local development. Like, I absolutely love that. The other cool thing was that um, the Mesos Slave inside of the Docker container would actually talk to the host Docker instance to launch um, sort of sibling Docker containers next to it when we started up those um, tasks. That was, again, fine on a single development machine building on your laptop or your desktop or something like that. But um, when it came to actually deploying that out across multiple Docker hosts, we ran into this issue, Mesos 809, um, which there's a hackathon on tomorrow, so if anyone wants to pair with me on that, I would greatly appreciate it, but I want to try and fix that. The issue is basically um, the Mesos master reports the IP address to Zookeeper, and of course it reports the Docker's IP address, which um, on a single machine, they're, they're routable within the one Docker host. Across multiple Docker hosts, um, they're not routable at all, so it all just fell apart. And um, so, yeah, we had to fix that. The other bit of friction was that um, services required a Eureka client in order to sort of register and start heartbeating with Eureka as the service locator. Now, not a, a huge problem, just a bit of friction in terms of development. As I said, we're mainly a Java house, so um, that wasn't a problem. But for other languages we wanted to, deploy to, wanted to deploy, so Python, Ruby, Node, Haskell, they um, required to interact with the um, Eureka remote API. So that was our first iteration. The second one, obviously, we pulled back from um, dockerizing everything, and we actually removed Eureka in order to reduce the complexity of what we're actually deploying and simply use Marathon to locate the host and port of the services. Now, whilst it did work reasonably well, you can think that there's a bit of a problem there. The beauty of Eureka was we could put an app into a starting state. Once it was actually ready to handle requests, we could put it into the running state, and then it could actually start serving requests. 
Marathon was a bit different in that um, once we started things up, it would give us the host and port, and we couldn't actually, um, I guess, in modify the state from within the application um, there. So we'd have items getting added into our load balancer pool um, that weren't actually starting. So if you think if you have to do that docker pool, that slug pool, and then the explode, all that time it's in the, pool, in the load balancer pool. Luckily our load balancer health checks so that um, th they don't actually become active in the pool until they, we get a green health check. So that was good. And at the time, we were using Marathon, we required, um, th there was gonna be an interruption in the service when we were deploying it. So we needed, we would've needed to write code in our service manager to orchestrate a um, deployment. I see, um, I haven't used Marathon in a while and I just spun it up yesterday, and I see you know, that they've got all these things, so that's awesome to see. So we actually pulled back from using Marathon and went to just Mesos and Aurora, and still using Aurora as, um, well, using Aurora as well as our service locator. The main reason we made this change was because of um, it provided a lot of functionality that we were going to implement anyway in our service manager. So those seamless rolling upgrades, the health checks, the health checks on the upgrades to verify that it was all um, working. So rather than re-implementing all that, we just used Aurora. Now, the setup and deployment of Aurora was, was quite a bit trickier than um, Marathon, but um, I, I guess to Marathon's credit, it is trivial to set up, so that was um, fantastic. And um, the load balancer manager and service manager needed to start talking thrift instead of a HTTP RESTful sort of JSON API that Marathon offered. Not, not huge problems, just a bit of friction in getting it set up there. So the current status of it is, um, as I said at the start, we're not in production with this. We're not serving production traffic. We're still in the development phase of it, building it out, trying to um, harden the platform and get things up. Now, um, there's a couple of challenges, and ha happy to, um, you know, bounce some ideas off people over a few beers tonight, but I'd really love to know how, if anyone is actually doing sort of multi-region Mesos or you know, how we're running that, um, or how you're running that. Um, I've got a few ideas on it. I'd love to, I'd love to hear some other people's ideas. Um, we have sort of traditionally our applications have a huge amount of state in them, and so I'd, I'd love to, like I loved hearing Ben talk about the um, container storage and things like that this morning, so being able to map those, it'd be good to talk about that. And then the last one was, um, this caused great debate internally, but how people go about actually testing services. And I think this is more of a problem um, going to the sort of microservice world in once you get 10, 100 services up and running, how do you go about testing that in an automated fashion? Do you spin up the world? Do you simply um, have some compatibility toolkit and mock out services? Do you do it live? Hopefully not. So anyway, thank you very much, guys.